listening to The Knicks Recap, your source for all New York Knicks-related content. What's going on, everybody, and welcome to another episode of The Knicks Recap, your source for all New York Knicks-related content. I'm your host, Troy, and don't forget to hit that notification bell so you stay updated with all of our latest episodes. You see a familiar face, don't you guys? Because I do. Now, joining me today, I have to say it the right way, legendary Knicks beat journalist, former New York Post journalist for the New York Knicks, leading them for years on years on years of great content. You see him with the relaxed shirt on right now, the always amazing Mark Berman. Mark, how you doing, man? Thanks for coming on the show again. Uh, doing great. Thanks again for inviting me. Uh, it's an honor to come on, and people maybe still remember my coverage. 23 straight seasons uh, on the Knicks. Very few playoffs, though. Uh, you know, four to five. This would have been maybe my fifth if I was still working. So yeah, this was the time of year you always looked forward to. Unfortunately, during my run, I just didn't have enough postseasons. So many years where March 1st, uh, the games were already meaningless during yeah. that stretch after the 2013 season, that glorious season that ended in the second round. There was maybe seven straight seasons, and I believe almost all of them uh, ended where they were not really in contention after March 1st. Luckily, two of the last three years, the Knicks have been in it. They have, and Mark, it's, you know, I wish you had another season. To, to, to discover the Knicks, because I could only imagine the banter between you and Mitchell Robinson. He's already got into it with Steph Bondi. I don't know if you've seen the interview where he was kind of asked about the big man. And, you know, they're, sure. they're, talk, <laughs> they're talking about, well, we got big man, too. What you what you talk about? So I, I think he would have had the same banter with you. What did you think about the interaction? Yeah, that was great. Uh, he asked him about Mobley and yeah. uh, Allen. And Mitchell always gets defensive. Uh, I remember a couple of years ago, three years ago in Atlanta, we were asking him about Capella. And he actually said the statement, he feels he's better than Capella. Uh, he's a very bold guy. And as you know, his social media, sometimes he gets a little whiny with his role in the offense. But no surprise. Listen, when I was in the locker room with Mitch, he was always busting my balls. It's just that you guys really never saw that. So then he's busting my balls during the, you know, formal press conference with uh, this. And, you know, everyone got a chance to see it. But, you know, we had uh, a few incidents uh, in the locker room in, in past years. But, yeah, he's, he actually is fun to deal with. He's got a great personality. He, he was very shy his rookie year, and he came out of his shell, and he's – Sort of like the clown of the locker room. I know I talked to some writers, and this year he's gotten a little edgy once in a while, not in the most playful way. But usually it's it's always been playful uh, with me, at least. You know, it's uh, it's funny we talk about, you know, just, just the season and what's going on right now because – my, my good friend Ian Bagley, who I had on the show uh, recently as well, too, you know, we were talking about this off air and, you know, Tom Thibodeau was asked in one of these uh, post, uh, you know, game conferences, you know, just he, about, you know, journalists and whatnot. And I remember specifically, I don't remember the exact term, but I specifically remember saying, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but, you know, I, I miss Berman. Where, where's Berman? So it, it's, you know, it's funny to see that. Me and Ian had a, a good laugh about it. What do you think about that? You, you are missed. I think Nick's Twitter misses you. I think the Knicks miss you. The Knicks players seem to miss you. No, I don't know Knicks about the Knicks you. players missing me. No, I don't know <laughs> about that. I think Tom a little bit. I think Tom uh, enjoyed the banter. Uh, listen, I've known Tom for a long time. You know, my first year on the beat in 99, 2000, he was the Knicks assistant coach. And you know, as an assistant coach, it was more chit-chatting with him about Jeff and making fun of Jeff about being too intense. But so I've known Tom a long time. And then when he went to Minnesota, you know, the Knicks were coming to Minnesota. I got there a day early and every all the writers in Minnesota were saying what a jerk he was and this and that. And I was like, wow. I mean, like, that's not the Tom I knew. I mean, he was always like nice with us. Uh 
but, but that's the beauty of Tom coming back to New York because he knew a few of us and he just felt a lot more comfortable. And I think he's so much more comfortable now in the press conferences, uh, you know, this season and then even uh, last season than he was his first year. But uh, yeah, I, I miss covering Tom too. Uh, he's a great, great coach and he doesn't get the credit. Other head coaches do not give him the credit. I think they realize like maybe he takes the regular season a little too seriously. And uh, But yeah, I do miss Tom. And it's flattering. that I think the first media day when I announced my retirement, he went to the uh, press conference and said, where's Berman? And he made a joke about he didn't believe I was retired, that I would pull a Tom Brady. Listen, man, I, I, th I think he really wanted you to get another year because I uh, from the team like I know you say the players don't miss you I feel like Barrett Mitchell Robinson they secretly miss you because you were one of their favorites to kind of you know at the at the end of the games especially when they were winning they would they would get at you a little bit you know they would they would uh, poke at you a little bit I think I think it, I think everybody enjoyed the banter honestly <laughs> we did yeah well I yeah RJ got on me quite a bit if I wrote something semi-critical like last season he was having a great year so any story that had a hint of criticism, you know, he freaked out about <laughs> with me. But uh, yeah, listen, they. I think it's a now that the locker room is open, uh, we'd be more in their face. Uh, I don't think uh, the players. I don't think the players wanted us back in the locker room. Quite frankly, I think they enjoy the uh, formality of the uh, press conferences and then the Zoom season, but. Uh, you know, it, it, I'm glad that Adam Silver actually allowed us back in because there was some at some point he said at, during an all star weekend press conference, he said that we're not sure if reporters were going back in the locker room. So That's right, it's great yeah. that they're back. And yeah, listen, it's a good group. Obi's a great guy. Emmanuel's a great guy. Miles is a good guy. Uh, you know, RJ is fun to deal with. Mitchell, it, it is a fun group. I mean, Julius is Julius. You know, he's, <laughs> he's a little moody, put it that way. You know, I was going to ask you about Julius. I'm glad you got to that. Before I get to the questions, though, there's one question that's been burning Nick fans' minds. Did you really find that relaxed shirt on the clearance sale? Yes. It was <laughs> in the store, very cheap, probably less than eight bucks. And wow. I said, oh, boy, I got to get this. It was, you know, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And uh, it's a nice shirt, a, a, a Floridian color. So I grabbed it. And then my uh, beautiful wife saw this also in a garage sale. Uh, and I think it's tough to see the whole word, but. <laughs> we can see it. <laughs> I, we can see it. It, it says, uh, I think it says relax also. I don't know what oh, it means. Oh my goodness. Uh, listen, <laughs> Mitchell Robinson's going to have a kick out of that. I love it. I think uh, the shirt with the photo of the car all together, it was the perfect image of you you look so happy we were so yeah. happy to see you just you know just happy being retired being in florida just being away from it all and you know we're really happy to see that you again i said it before the call with you right now you look glowing you look happier so i'm, I'm happy for you yeah no um, i do feel relaxed uh it's it's such a grind i mean 82 games the travel uh you know the new york post you know you got to provide a lot of content we have early editions have to write before the game, during the game, at the end of the game. Yeah, it's it's a it's a lot. Twenty three seasons was a lot. You know, I'm thrilled to be retired. Although I may have mentioned to you off camera, you know, this is the time of year where you feel like, oh, you want to be in the middle of it. You want to be in the mix, uh, especially this series coming up, which is going to be a dandy. I, I really uh, I can't wait to watch all of it, and I think Knicks fans can't wait. They want to avenge the feeling they had two years ago when it was such a beautiful regular season yeah. and then Atlanta just knocked them out in five games. Yeah, you know, and and you just spoke on it. We're going to go right into it, right? The Knicks versus the Cavaliers. Four seed versus five seed. We kind of knew this was the trajectory going into, you know, the postseason for quite some games now. I think, you know, maybe there we thought there could be shift shake up with the Nets coming up and the Heat coming up. But now we saw what those teams have fallen to. It's it's interesting because for me, when I saw the schedule drop in the East, there is no better matchup for me than Cavs versus Knicks. 
On the West, you know, for me, it'd probably be Kings and Warriors that I'm most looking forward to on that end. For you, just for the playoffs in general, from what you've seen, what is the series for you to watch? Is it the Knicks and Cavaliers? Well, in the East, there's no question about it. I mean, most people think the Sixers are going to annihilate the Nets. And, you know, I, I don't know if it's going to be a sweep, but I think that's going to be lopsided. Listen, the Western Conference has a great series with the Lakers and Memphis. You know, you, everyone is going to want to watch that, especially, I mean, the Lakers did not look good at all uh, in that uh, one game uh, against the Timberwolves in the play-in uh, bout. But uh, I think everyone wants to see Lakers, Memphis. But in the East, it's Knicks, Cavaliers. It's, su it's such a close matchup. And you got a lot of personalities, a lot of players that the whole nation knows about. And the, when the Knicks are good, and LeBron James said this two years ago, uh, you know, when the Knicks were finally getting back in the playoffs, mm -hmm. when the Knicks are good, the NBA is a better league. And the NBA is hurting right now. There's been too much controversy with Kyrie Irving and Zion Williamson, Williamson not wanting to play in the playoffs and Cuban uh, pulling his antics. Uh, at least Adam Silver uh, has the Knicks alive. Thank you, Lee, for that. And, you know, it's it's funny. We're talking about these other teams that are kind of melting down the season itself, right? John Morant with his issues, Zion with his issues, you know, Mark Cuban talking about, you know, blaming Rick Brunson. I mean, there's so many different storylines going on. But for me, one of the storylines that I feel like uh, has not been touched a lot uh, is the key factor to these to these series, right? Because we talk about, you know, who is going to be the key? Who is going to be the player that's going to make or break you know, the team getting over the hump and going to the second round. You know, I spoke with Ian Bagley about this as well, too. Personally, for me, I thought it was R.J. Barrett. He uh, gave me Quentin Grimes. The reason I said R.J. Barrett personally is because I feel like as soon as Jalen goes across half court, he's going to be doubled. And when Randall catches the ball, if he plays, obviously, which I think he will, um, if he does play and he's in the paint, he's going to get doubled as soon as he hits that ball. So Cleveland's going to have a lot of room open. They've, they've shown it, too. They're okay with letting Barrett shoot. They were okay with letting Barrett drive and make the high IQ play of either passing or going into two or three people. So they're comfortable doing that. Uh, that's why I think R.J. Barrett, for me, has to, you know, abuse the matchup that he's given, whoever that may be, Carlos LeVert, Lamar Stevens, you know, Isaac Okoro, if he's playing, whoever that may be. For you, who do you think the key Nick player is to winning this series against the Cavs? Yeah, the minute you asked the question, I thought R.J. is the X factor. If he's hitting his three-pointer, the Knicks are a different ball club. I think Jalen may find it difficult, you know, getting into the paint against that wall of Cleveland defenders with Mobley and Allen. So he's going to have to dish off uh, to the three-point line. Quentin is huge because he's going to have to shut down Donovan Mitchell, and he's also going to have to hit the three when he's open. But RJ is a volume shooter. He's got to be efficient. Unfortunately, you know, he didn't have a good playoff two years ago against Atlanta, but that was only his second season in the league. Uh, has he improved a lot? In some facets, he's become a, a better a driver, but it's a three-point shooter. He's stagnated. In fact, may have even worsened from last season, unfortunately. You don't know what you're going to get from him from the three-point line. If he can knock down his threes efficiently, the Knicks have a real chance of posting the upset. Listen, the Cavaliers are favored, not by much, a slight favorite, but RJ as the X factor, as you said. And plus, you know, defensively, he's got to step up too. As Walt Frazier said late in the season, you know, RJ's defense is something to be uh, less. It's He's a number three pick. He's got to be a great two-way player. Otherwise, you know, Listen, I know Zion Williamson can't even get on the court, so RJ <laughs> looks so much better than Zion, but yeah. RJ, after that contract extension, he has to be better on both ends. You know, I was going to ask you about RJ Barry because I agree with you. I think, listen, I, I love the kid. I don't want it. I know a lot of fans are thinking about trading him. There's so many, you know, Nick Twitter's on fire with half of them wanting to trade him, half of them wanting to keep him. You know, my whole thing is you can't really trade RJ Barrett anyways if you wanted to. I mean, his value is probably lower than it was last year. Um, if you traded him for a quote unquote star player, you'd have to attach so many picks and other players. For me, it doesn't really make sense. I'm okay with giving RJ another year, but I think you hit the nail on the head. He he's regressed defensively. His three point shooting has not been where it needs to be. Uh, teams leave him open. 
And they leave him open because he doesn't hit the three. He has to drive to be better. I've said it before and I'll say it again. RJ with a mid-range needs to be better. You know, when I used to play ball, I used to start at the closest I could be at the, the rim and I'd back up a little bit till I, you know, got comfortable and then I would go back again. I think that's what he needs to do. You know, just overall thoughts real quick, uh, Mark, regarding RJ Barrett's uh, regular season thus far. Yeah, well, the thing with RJ is he's so streaky. I mean, he'll have some great games where he's seven of nine and then he'll be all of nine. I right. mean, you just don't know with RJ and you know, this is, there's so much pressure on him. He knows it. He's, he's ready to go on to a huge contract. This is his fourth year, final year of his rookie deal. And now he'll start his extension year. And listen, I don't know what my competitors have been writing uh, after I retired that well about RJ and the trade with Donovan but I know for a fact the Knicks were eager, eager to give uh, RJ away in that trade. It was about the first round unprotected picks uh, that they didn't want to give as many uh, away. So they were fine to give up RJ. They had to save face and sign him to a contract extension. They didn't even want to do that. But they realized, oh boy, we lost out on Donovan. We better make a move to make it look like we're doing something good. So they immediately, even before, they knew Donovan was going uh, to Cleveland. Then they announced it before Cleveland announced it, announces it that RJ had a contract extension. He had a contract extension because they couldn't move him in the Donovan deal. And, um, you know, we're going from one player. And thanks for that insight, by the way. We, when last time we spoke, I think you gave me that direct insight as well. And sometimes when people hear that, they don't want to believe it. Because they feel like, you know, they wouldn't do that for RJ. They wouldn't give up the the pick for RJ. But, you know, not only you, Ian Bagley, uh, Steph Bondi, Fred Katz. I mean, a lot of notable journalists have already reported that that was primarily the trade. But as you said, the first round picks were the biggest. Yeah, pain yeah we were reporting that. it on August uh, 1st and uh, yeah. pretty much exclusively. And uh, that it wasn't about RJ. It was about the unprotected first round picks. And listen, if Donovan goes for 45 points and a Cleveland win in game one and RJ has a stinker, oh boy, Nick's Twitter will light up, to put it's, it mildly. Yeah, it's already on fire because people are expecting RJ to, you know, have a really good series. And I hope he does. And I hope he plays at his strength. That's that's how he's going to have a good series. If he drives, attacks, goes to the line, that's how he's going to have a good series. If he relies on the three or, you know, falls in love with it too much, you know, I, I don't know if he's going to have a great series. He's going to have to play with what his strengths are. Talking about a player that plays to his strengths every time he gets on the floor has made the biggest impact to this Knicks team, Jalen Brunson. I mean... I don't, there's not any, there's so many words I can say about him, but just impactful is kind of where it lays for me. What do you expect from Jalen Brunson come postseason? Because there is a little bit of talk that, you know, I, I, even though he did what he did against the Jazz, that it may be hard to replicate that in a New York Knicks outfit because he doesn't have, you know, the presence of a Luka behind him. What are your thoughts on Jalen Brunson? Are you, are you fearful of him going into the postseason? Or are you more confident than some others? I'm always confident in Jalen. And listen, Luca was injured for a couple of those games against Utah, and Jalen had terrific outings. Uh, it's just Cleveland's a tough team. Uh, and Garland, is, is he's going to have to play defense, and that's going to take a lot out of him. He's going to have to try to shut down Garland, and he's a handful. So, it, you know, the, it's two ends of the court. But uh, listen, Jalen's a winner. He's clutch. He's poised. He's able to give the Knicks pace, which they've never had before. Uh, great shot maker, clutch shot maker. Again, scouts you talked to this week, you know, when he gets it, he loves to get inside, gets into the lane. But, you know, Mobley and Allen will be there. They're ready for him. So uh, he's going to need help. But, uh he, there's so much confidence in the guy because he's always been a winner. And can he lead them single-handedly to victory in this series? No, he's going to need a lot of help because they're going to be doubling him. They're going to try to get the ball out of his hands, as you probably mentioned. And that's where the ball 
is going to wind up in Barrett's hands. He'll be wide open from three. Maybe Grimes will get some open looks from deep. But yeah, Jalen's uh, terrific. I've said this before. Tom thought that if the Knicks only had one all-star uh, this year, it should have been Jalen and not Julius. But Jalen plays that point guard position where there's so many great players. But yeah, it, listen, we if you remember draft night, Every Nick fan, and that maybe every, but most Nick fans were like, "We're giving up our lottery pick for cap space." Uh, I mean, they were stunned. Is Jalen Brunson worth it? He's been <laughs> worth it. Yeah, he's making that hundred million contract look like an absolute steal. Personally, for me, I know it's competitive, but I feel like, given the play he's had, especially the play after All Star break, why I feel like he's just went off. In terms of when we needed him the most, I feel like he deserves an, an all NBA, uh, you know, nod. Would you agree with that, or do you and do you think he's going to make that? Yeah, I don't think he will. Um, it's just a lot of point guards and guards. You know, they pick guards together, so yeah. I think he's going to fall a little short. You know, maybe off this year, maybe he could carry that to ne- a, a next season honor. Uh, but I think he's a long shot for third team. Julius has a chance because of his position. Uh, but listen, Jalen has had an all NBA top season. Give Leon Rose credit. I wrote this near the end of my tenure, uh, an anecdote that the very first scouting meeting Leon had with his new scouts, you know, they were talking about the future and what guys he likes. One of the guys he mentioned all the way over three years ago was Jalen. And some of the scouts raised their eyebrows because three years ago, like Jalen was still a second round pick who was trying to make his way as an established player. So Leon has been all over Jalen, obviously, as his agent uh, from the beginning. So uh, it's a great story. You know, Leon would get more credit if he talked to the media and, you know, did what a president should do. But give him give him loads of credit on Jalen. Give him loads of credit on the 225th. Uh, selections and uh, quickly and Quentin Grimes. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I mentioned this about Leon that, you know, obviously he's had chances to make certain trades, right? If he included some more picks, you know, there was rumored to be, you know, Zach Levine, uh, potentially that trade going off in the uh, before trade deadline. He's had chances to potentially make these moves, but it seems like he draws a line in the sand at some point where too much is too much. And if it's not going to benefit him or the team enough, he's going to say no. Is that what you're seeing as well, too, from him? Yeah, without a doubt. That's been uh, the history of Leon as president, where he, he, his philosophy is uh, a no move is better than a bad move. And his <laughs> director of strategy, Brock Aller, is very protective of those first round picks and of draft capital. And he's been... He has Leon's ear, ear, and, you know, much to Tom's frustration that Donovan deal did not go through. And, and you know, we're led to believe that Brock had a say in let's keep these first round picks and let's not get robbed here. There'll be a, another star down the road that, uh, you know, we can we can go after. So there was they've had a lot of patience. I mean, a couple of trade deadlines, they decided not to do anything. Leon is very big with I don't want to mess up if things are going well. I don't want to tinker with the locker room chemistry. Very patient guy, Leon Rose. And, you know, you mentioned first round picks. I would, you know, I have to bring him up going from one actual pick to the pick that we use for a player, Obi Toppin. Now, he has so much fan favor to and for him, right? I've had a couple of knocks on Obi Toppin's game. I feel like he needs to get stronger. I feel like his body hasn't really evolved, uh, so he can't really take contact as much. And his cutting is obviously going to be affected by that because even when you cut, you're still going to take con- – people are going to be at the rim to meet you. You're going to have to take contact anyways. So I feel like his body needs to get stronger. And with Julius there, I can't see why. <laughs> He's just trained with Julius for a summer, and he'll probably be there. Um, so, you know, that, his rebounding, things like that. But, you know, he does what he does well. He ekes out well. He's a one-man fast break. He dunks. He highlight reel. He gets the crowd hype. So he does those things. But for me, I feel like as soon as Randall comes back, it's going to return to status quo. I mean, even though he's done what he's done in these last couple games, we saw that before where he's went off in these last couple games, but it really didn't change where he was in the lineup. Do you feel like Obi Toppin, given what he's done in his last final stretch of games, 
if Julius does return for the first game, that he'll see higher uh, usage? It all depends on what kind of Julius Randle uh, is is playing in game one or game two. Uh, if Julius looks like an all NBA guy and he's a ferocious inside and he's hitting a three point shot and he's drawing fouls and he's rebounding, Obi's going to play 11 minutes. But, you know, if listen, what happened la- uh, two years ago in the playoffs, Julius was way out of his comfort zone. He, he looked nervous. He had too much adrenaline. Then they put Obi in, and Obi lit up the crowd. He played fearlessly, and he started to get some minutes. You know, the, going into that series, I had written that the coaching staff was debating whether, you know, Obi would get minutes in the playoffs in, in that type of atmosphere because of his defensive shortcomings. But uh, it all depends on how good Julius is going. And that's the problem with Obi's whole career. It all is dependent on Julius Randle, which is why – Giving him an important contract extension, Obi, that is, doesn't seem like a good idea. If your future is all about Julius Randle being your first or second star, then Obi probably should be moving on to a place uh, where he can shine. And, you know, scouts still believe in him. They say, you know, put him on another team in a starting lineup. Obi might be a different player. He'd have plenty of confidence. I think Obi knows that. Tom doesn't fully believe in him as a two-way player, isn't sure about his defensive IQ. He's not a great rebounder like he was in college. But Obi will play significant minutes if Julius is struggling or obviously if he can't make it back for game one. And that's the real big question that we got to move into, right? Julius Randle, uh, two-time All-Star, obviously made his second All-Star appearance this year. Uh, had a in terms of seasons, obviously before the I think after All Star break, he's had a couple of little meltdowns. Obviously the issue with IQ and whatnot. Um, but other than that, in terms of if you want to wipe those away, his season has probably been his best season of his career. You know, I think Jalen Brunson has a lot to do with that in terms of just making it easier for him to score because he doesn't have to do it himself anymore. He has Jalen to lean on, and I think he, you can see he trusts everybody a little bit more. I think obviously IQ I think gained a little bit of his trust. I know Jalen has. Uh, but that's the biggest question mark for me, because personally, I don't think the Knicks have a hope of beating Cleveland if Julius Randle doesn't play. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think that the Knicks can beat Cleveland without Randall? And do you expect them to play game one? Yeah, they have no chance without Randall. And I, I'm amazed when I sometimes see on Twitter that theory that the Knicks could be a better team with OB. Uh, listen, they move the ball better. Uh, without with Obi and uh, and Julius on the bench, the, the ball moves a little better. But Julius does so many things offensively and draws so much attention. Bricker staff knows how great Julius is, and they'll swarm him. And Julius has to play smart, and he has to distribute. But he's he's the key cog. You know, you need him in the lineup. Is he going to play game one? I think he plays. I know the Knicks are being coy. They will not let Julius talk to the media. Today, he did not talk again. Tomorrow, there's no availability. I believe if Julius spoke to the media, he'd probably say something like, oh, I'm playing. You'd have to drag me off the court. I'm (laughs) playing game one. They they want to keep Bickerstaff and the Cavaliers coaching staff guessing on whether Julius will be out there for game one. You saw how Julius did not want to come out of that game when he – severely sprained his ankle against Miami in late March. Yeah. He's a warrior. He plays through so much pain. You don't play 77 straight games to start the season if you don't uh if you don't play through pain. And listen, I know that the doctors have like different barometers and strength tests, but this is the playoffs. They haven't put him through a contact workout. But I would be shocked if he wasn't there for game one. If they decide to say, hey, we're going well with Obi, let's see what we look like in game one. All we have to do is split in Cleveland, and they give him three more days for game two. I think game two at the very latest. But if I was a betting man, I would say game one. And one of the reasons is the Knicks have refused to allow Julius to talk to the reporters this week. 
You know, I, as soon as uh, uh, I heard that first from Ian Bagley, the first time I heard that, I thought the exact same thing you did. Because if I'm a team who doesn't have home court advantage, who well, obviously, you know, the other team has probably the best player on that team in terms of Donovan Mitchell, right? He's a megastar in terms of what he can do. Having his best season as a Cavalier, dropping more 40 balls than I can imagine in a season. So if I'm going against that team and I want to keep them guessing, because I know I got to get one. I at least got to get one in Cleveland. I want them to stay guessing until the last possible moment. So that way they have to rush to put something together. But obviously we know with teams, they're going to have two strategies, one with Julius, one without. So they're going to cover both. But you want them to guess. You don't want them to know exactly what to do when they get there. And I think that's what's happening. And I absolutely agree. I think there's no way you can stop the Iron Man, who is Julius Randle, from playing game one. I think he's been locked in and set on game one as soon as they said, you got to rest for two weeks. As soon as they said that, I think he already knew in his head, I'm going to get back. And regardless if I'm even 90 percent, I'm going to go. And I, I think that's going to happen personally. So I definitely agree with you there, Mark. The the thing that I, I well, want to tomorrow know, they release tomorrow night. I think they release the injury report and correct. the Knicks have to designate him. I imagine they'll put him at questionable. Yeah. And my <laughs> sense is that the next day, uh, even after the shoot around, even at 5 p.m. when Thibodeau talks to the media, I have a feeling they're going to say game time decision. Took the words right out of my mouth. I know they're going to do that. They did that with RJ Barrett. They did with Jalen Brunson in key matchups uh, before. Jalen Brunson's had that tag a lot, um, you know, given some injuries he's had. And normally when the game has mattered, he played. So I, I feel like that's what's happening here. Uh, for me, Saturday, game one, I feel like the energy in that building and the competition level is going to go through the roof. I expect that game to be extremely competitive, and I expect that matchup uh, not to be one-sided. I know some people think that maybe Cleveland because of home court and these things that they might you know, blow it out a little bit. I don't see it that way. I see it being a fight from quarter one to quarter four. What are your expectations for game one, and uh, what do you think? Is it going to be one-sided, or do you think it's going to be a competitive battle back and forth in that series yeah. for game one. Yeah, I think this series in general, not just game one, I have a feeling that almost every game is going to go down to the final two minutes. I think it's going to be that type of series. Maybe the Cavs have one blowout, and I don't know if it's game one, but listen, that's a very loud arena. Uh, even when LeBron left, it gets loud in there. They have very good acoustics. They have very good fans. Uh, so... It's going to be a tough environment for the Knicks. They've been a very good road team. Uh, but game one is going to be very challenging, especially with the the rust of Julius Randle. Uh, and, you know, Jalen hasn't played in a while, too. They shut him down. He had a couple of nicks and bruises. And, you know, no one ever talks about it. He's had some injuries this season. So let's hope Jalen stays healthy across uh, this series as well. But... Uh, I do expect almost every game, two minutes left, it's like one possession. And that's why I think this will be the best series uh, in the NBA. The Lakers-Memphis will be just compelling just because of the, all the stars on the court and the Lakers brand. And Ja is the most exciting player in the NBA. But yeah. this is the most competitive. I absolutely agree with that. I think the competition level is definitely uh, different when it comes to this. Um, I also am really looking forward to the Warriors and Kings. I think that's going to be great. Um, I think it just just because of the the lightning shooting you're going to see from Fox and you're going to see from uh, Curry and Poole and Thompson, I think it's going to be a great series as well, too. Uh, probably the best in the West, in my opinion. Um, a lot of people are calling the Cleveland versus Knicks the battle of the bigs with uh, Mitchell Robinson, some Julius Randle, perhaps Isaiah Hartenstein. Then you got Evan Mobley, who could be, you know, potentially win defensive player of the year. And then you have, uh, you know, obviously Jared Allen with his positioning this year. You can make the argument for the entire season. Allen's probably outdone Mobley because Mobley really came on after All-Star break, I think. But Allen has been, you know, a double, a walking double, double, 25 and 10 or 15 for the season. So, you know, it's compelling to think about Battle of the Bigs. If you think about it in that regards, who would you give the edge to? Would you give it to the Knicks big men or to the Cavs big men? 
Well, I love Mitchell Robinson, but this is his first playoff action. Two years ago, obviously he had the broken hand. The Knicks had Nerlens Noel as the starting center, and he did not fare well. Uh, listen, it's a different stage, and you know Mitchell could be a little too hyped, could get in foul trouble. I think the Knicks are going to need a big series from Hardenstein. Uh, you know he could do a lot of things. He's a better passer than Mitchell. Listen, if Mitchell could get those second chance points, he's such a great offensive rebounder. Uh, that would be so huge. And if he could stay out of foul trouble and if he could block some shots that matter, that aren't just look good, that they get the possession out of it, yeah. uh, he could be a real factor. But, you know, his game is so limited. I love Jared Allen. I covered his first All-Star game a few years ago when he was with the Nets and no one in the audience <laughs> knew who he was. Uh, he was so out of place in a game in an All-Star game like that. Yeah. But I think he's so underrated. I love him. I love what he does. The rim protection, obviously, with him and Mobley, it's a little better than the Knicks because you got Mitchell, but then you really don't have a shot blocker in Obi at all or Randall. That's the one problem with Julius, and that's why they don't do the Julius Toppin uh, power forward center combination because yeah. neither protects the rim well. So, you know, you got to go with Cleveland. I mean, it's the best front court tandem center power forward in the game, kind of old school. Uh, and, you know, Mitchell's a little bit of a wild card uh, being his first time in the playoffs. And I agree with that as well, too. I, I will say, though, in terms of, you know, uh, offensive, defensive, and, you know, just total rebounds, you know, the Knicks are really like third, eighth, and third in the league in terms of that. Yeah. That's how they've made their – because they're not a really good shooting team, right? They, they take a lot of threes, but they don't really make a lot of threes. And even their field goal percentage is, you know – subpar in that regard but the reason they stay in games is because of those second chance opportunities which Mitchell Robinson has a lot to do with Isaiah Hartenstein Julius Randle uh even Josh Hart Emmanuel Quick yeah they extent. got a lot of good guard rebounders I mean Jalen yeah. could rebound Barrett can rebound Hart can rebound it's a good team rebounding club better than Cleveland but those yeah. two guys up front with Cleveland you know it, it's the best in the business uh, at least in the east yeah, defense. I mean, obviously, uh, Cavs have been, you know, best defense, I think, uh, pretty much all season. And that they're a big reason uh, why. But also, here's the here's the key for me. And a lot of people are kind of I, I was in a Twitter space today and one of the uh, speakers I, I was speaking with told me that the bench doesn't matter in uh, in playoff series. And in my head, I'm thinking to myself, then how do you explain a manual quickly? Potentially, you know, he might win six man of the year, but from the votes I've seen, I think Brogdon's probably going to take it from him. Um, but e either way, though, he's had a phenomenal year, career year. I think the benches do matter. And if you're looking at it from that regard, I don't think Levert and, you know, Wade and um, who else they have? I don't know if Lamar Stevens comes off the bench. Uh, I think yeah. they have C.D. Osman as well, too, right? Yeah, so they have, is the three-point shooter, yeah. Right. They have a couple people on their bench, but, you know, obviously you have Quickly, you have Toppin, you have Hart. You have Isaiah Hartenstein. I mean, I, I would think the Knicks bench, you know, is better than Cleveland's bench. Do you think that's a factor in this series? Yeah, well, listen, Emmanuel might close a game. If if RJ is not playing well, right. you know, you're going to have Emmanuel with two minutes left. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think the, the deeper, the better, without a doubt. And the Knicks probably have the edge, but I don't know. I've said this before. I saw LeVert in the bubble, uh, not just the playoffs, but in the bubble with the Nets. And that guy looked like an all-star and he comes off the bench for Cleveland. If he turns it up a notch, you know, he's very dangerous. Osman could hit the three. Uh, you know, Okoro usually will start, but he's been injured and he could be a good defender against Jalen uh, Brunson. So there's some depth with Cleveland. The Knicks are a little deeper. Uh, and it's amazing that we're mentioning all these Knicks players and not Derrick Rose or Evan Fournier. It's just shocking that they've been <laughs> out of the rotation most of the season and they're doing it without him. And even <clears throat> Miles McBride, if yep. you need him for a defensive stop, you know, I'd love to see if Garland is going nuts. I'd love to see Miles come in for a two minute stretch and try to slow down uh, Darius Garland. And I think that's a good point, actually. Uh, 
<clears throat> Cleveland, for me, I, I've said it before. I don't think – I think if you're comparing the benches, especially Levert, who I feel like, you know, when he was a net, he looked like he could be, uh, you know, all-star for every single year he played there. He was just phenomenal. I think in Cleveland, he took a step back. Obviously, he started uh, at some point, got replaced by uh, Lamar Stevens, was coming off the bench, been streaky since then. He reminds me a lot of Brand- Brandon Jennings, not on defense, obviously, because he's a better defender than Jennings, but streaky-wise – he feels like that player now because if he gets hot, he'll he'll stay hot like he's that type of player. But if he's cold, he's ice cold and he gets can't recover from that. So I think with him, you're getting a mixed bag in regards to that. And I think he's the best person coming off their bench. Osmond can get hot, but he doesn't get involved in the offense too much when you have Donovan Garland and, uh, you know, Mobley and a- Allen to kind of feed. And really they're not even making a you know, a, a really good play on their big man in terms of inside play with Allen and Mobley. They could use them so much better, I feel like, but they haven't really done that in terms of assist with those guys. Maybe they'll ramp it up a little bit more. But, you know, when we're talking about players and adjustments, right, you, you got to look at the coaching. And I think that might be the key factor here. You know, JB Bakerstaff, and then you have Tom Thibodeau. Uh, how much do you think coaching will play a part here and uh, and I, I think I already know the answer to this. Do you feel Thibs will uh, adjust anything if his players are healthy? Uh, well, if you're talking about Obi, listen, I think Tom does such a better job than most Knicks fans in terms of recognizing who is who has the hot hand. And if Obi is is doing well. And, you know, Randall is so-so and rusty. Obi will get his minutes. But, listen, the coaching, there's no doubt Thibodeau has a big edge. Bickerstaff is a good coach, players coach, really nice guy. He was David Fisdale's right-hand man in Memphis. Uh, You know, they didn't do well in the play-in last year. Uh, But, you know, he's okay with X's and O's. But, listen, Tom Thibodeau has been around for so much longer. He's seen it all. He's the best preparer in the business, uh, and it's nice that he has an extra, you know, almost a week to prepare for this game. And I think the Knicks uh, have the coaching edge, and I still believe that Tom knows who to play and when to play. I feel he has that instinct. One thing about David Fisdale when he was with the Knicks he never knew who had the hot hand. He never knew he'd take out a hot player and put in a player who was struggling. He always seemed to make the wrong maneuver. Tom doesn't really do that. I know that fans are all over the OB thing and maybe Emmanuel last season, but uh, I honestly think that Tom's going to manage a really good game. My only, The one thing I don't like about Tom, the only thing, and I wrote about it a lot last season, I don't like when he runs up the score. I hate when he keeps his regulars <laughs> on the court in a 22-point game. And yeah. listen, I don't want to, you know, talk load management, and maybe Tom should subscribe to it. But Julius Randle does get hurt after 77 straight games and hurts his ankle. And maybe if he had a little more rest during the season and didn't play, you know, on a night when he could have played 30 minutes, he played 39 minutes, you know, maybe his – ankles and feet would be a little fresher and he wouldn't have, he would have recovered a little quicker from his ankle injury. And, but you know, th- that's my only uh, issue with Tom, but that doesn't matter in the playoffs In the playoffs, you know, you're supposed to keep even a 13 point game with, you know, a minute left, you know, you never know what miracles do happen. And Reggie Miller uh, knows that. Yeah, so does Tracy McGrady. I remember those games. Oh, my goodness. A minute left, 13 points. I can still recall it in my head watching it on TNT as a kid. It was That was probably one of the most craziest games I've ever seen. It, it, it's, it's, and I think that's why Tom Thibodeau does it, especially yeah. in the time in, in, in this league. It's so different. The three is so that's prominent. It. You know, it, you kind of – every lead is not safe because four minutes to go, you're up by 20. You know, three three-pointers, you're, you're only up 11. You Correct. Know, so, and, and Tom yeah. always talks about – when any time I've ever questioned it, and it's very infrequent, but any time I've asked him about it, he always talks about in this day and age that three point shot could get you back in a game. But my point is, like, it's in Detroit in February, and you're up 20, and there's two minutes and 40 seconds left. <laughs> you could take that risk. Yeah. 
No, I think I, he's definitely been guilty of that before. Actually, you know, I think while he's probably made, I, I'll give him this, I think he's made better adjustments as the season's progressed. I think during the beginning stages of the season, maybe still experimenting, maybe, I don't know. I felt like he was taking out the hot hand or maybe per, perhaps taking out players that were doing okay, but then replace them with, you know, another type of player. I felt like that happened a little bit during the beginning of the season. I will give you, though, I think coming into, you know, after All-Star break, the adjustments have been there. And I, I think, you know, a lot of Nick fans begrudgingly have to tip their hat to it. And when you look at, you know, coach of the year candidates, you got some votes because, yeah. you know, he, he did he turn this team votes. around. Right. Yeah. You Listen, know? when you had Reddish on the team, I know there was a big Reddish faction yeah. and they were so <laughs> upset because he had a very good start to the season. Yeah. And then suddenly he was banished. And when Tom doesn't like you, it's it, when you're in Tom's doghouse, it's almost impossible to get out. He just never thought he was a winning player. He thought he was all flash and not not enough substance. So yeah. when they make the trade for Hart, who he loves, he's loved since the draft, you know, it, it's made it so much easier for Tom. I think it's relaxed him because he's got all guys now that he likes. Obviously, we, we don't want to beat a dead horse. He didn't want the reddish trade. Yeah. And it kind of was tough for him to have to banish reddish because he was like, I never wanted the guy. So, like, I'm not going to play him. I'm going to play guys that I like. And now he's got players he likes. And it probably is tough for him not to be able to play Miles McBride because right. he really loves his defense. But, um, listen, I think I think we're okay with Tom Thibodeau versus Bickerstaff in this series. So, uh, real quick, so I'm going to have a couple other questions to uh, take. We're going to do this as fast as possible because I know you have to go, and I really appreciate you giving us so much time. I mean, you've been great to talk to, Mark. Always love chopping it up with you. Um, so, in regards to this series, who wins this series and why? And also, how far does it go? Yeah, well, I mean, my prediction is is the Cavaliers uh, with the home court. Yeah. advantage with the uncertainty on what level of play Randall will give us, give the Knicks. Uh, so I'm going to go for two. Donovan Mitchell, he's he's something else. I know last playoff with Utah, he was very inefficient. In fact, for two straight years, he hasn't had a great playoff. I think he has a lot to prove, especially against the Knicks and their brass that would not pulled the trigger. He waited all summer. He was in New York all summer. He thought this deal was happening. And now he gets a chance to close out the season. I think he's going to seize it. Um, so I, I think it's 4-2. Again, if Randall, if there was no injury to Randall, I would take the Knicks in seven. If this was a different, if we could go back three weeks and Randall was still on the court against Miami and and you asked me how are the Knicks are going to do in a series against Cleveland, I'd say I think the Knicks are going to, you know, they probably won't have home court, but I think the Knicks are going to win in seven. But the Randall thing is is disturbing, and that's why I have to go with Cleveland four games to two. I hear that. Um, personally, for me, I, I don't know if it's because of the show name, but uh, I'm going with the Knicks uh, in – Six, not because it <laughs> rhymes though, just because I, I really feel like it will. I, I look, I list, I think Julius Randle will play. I think he will be very, very good and efficient. I feel like in the Mobley matchup when he faces him, he does very well, and I think now he has help to do better. So I think, um, just given that, I think it is going to be Knicks and six. I do steal, I, I do see them stealing one in Cleveland, um, especially if Randle plays. If Randle plays, I, I'm definitely giving it to, uh, to the Knicks. Um, if, if he doesn't, it's going to be competitive, but I can't see them beating them without the, you know, the two-time all-star there. Um, so just real quick about Josh Hart, because you, you did mention him, right? I, personally, for me, a lot of people are, you know, really upset about the first round pick, especially now with the Mavericks out of the play-in, their pick, you know, in limbo right now. We don't know if it's going to, obviously we, we have hope, we're praying that it, it drops out of 10 and it goes to 11. We like that. But, you know, clearly with the odds in their favor, it's likely not going to do that. It might end up somewhere 10, right? Nine, maybe. So we're not going to get that pick. Uh, so really, the, the the question is, is, did the Knicks make the right move to get Josh Hart? My opinion is yes. And what do you think about him and his impact to this team since he's been here? Well, it was a brilliant move because they got rid of a player that the coach didn't want. So <laughs> even if they don't re-sign Josh Hart, it was the right move. 
But yeah, I think they are going to resign Josh Hart. I think he loves New York. Uh, you know, they say, you know, why would a player want to be in New York with the pressure? And well, look at Josh Hart. He's in Portland. You know, he was, I guess he was with the Lakers, but he, no one around the league ever talked a lot about Josh Hart. But he becomes a Nick. He has some success on a successful team. And now everyone in the country knows Josh Hart. I mean, it's just when you're winning and you're playing well in New York, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like being a Knickerbocker. And I think he realized just how great these fans are. I mean, maybe the best in the league. I, I have to feel that at this point, you know, because I cover them 23 seasons, most of them without a playoff berth that these right. fans continue to stick with this team. Uh, it's just remarkable through all the, the turmoil. And I think Josh Hart is going to resign. I think Leon Rose desperately wants him to resign. So does Tom Thibodeau. So I don't see why he would uh, look anywhere else. And I think the money will be there for him. Uh, so that was the main question about Josh. I, I think he's he does everything. He rebounds. Yeah. He's Tom's type of player. Yeah. Great spirit in the locker room. I think Jalen needed another guy. Julius is not a leader. Listen, it, it's not the worst thing in the world. Not all these star players can be leaders also. And Julius last season, they needed him to lead, and he was frustrated with his play. He was frustrated with the fans. He just didn't have it in him to lead that club. And their leadership last season was almost maybe one of the worst-led teams I've covered. Uh, last season uh, because Julius was such a misery. But but now Julius doesn't have to be that vocal leader. And Josh Hart and Jalen Brunson are in that locker room leading the way. And, you know, it, again, a, a terrific trade by Leon. So let me let me let me uh, just, you know, have my crystal ball out. OK, just bring it out. OK, I'm looking into it. The Knicks beat the Cavs somehow and they make it past the Cavs. How far do they go from there? Because the next matchup is likely the Milwaukee Bucks. Yeah, well, if they do beat the Cavs, and it's possible if Randall is Randall, uh, the Bucks are a tough matchup for them. Uh, Giannis has always gotten the best out of the Knicks. He, he's just, I mean, not that any other team does well against him, but <laughs> he's just tough to stop. And yeah. The Knicks don't have one player that I think that could really do that. And they have great experience. They have a great coach in Budenholzer. I think they could give them a competitive series. But unfortunately, with their seeding and getting the Bucs next, listen, if they played Boston or Philadelphia, I think the Knicks, if they take out the Cavs and Randall is rolling and they have no other injuries, I think, you know, the Sixers and Boston, the Knicks match up well against. The Bucks, I don't think so. And maybe they could take it to six, seven games, but I just I just don't see it. I, they need another piece. Uh, they don't have, you know, Giannis is clearly, clearly the best player on the court, and he's got a lot of pieces. And Bobby Portis, oh boy, he would be so up for that series to knock out the Knicks. Uh, so, yeah, I don't think they could get by uh, the Bucs if, if, if they can get by Cleveland first. And uh, this is really the last question for you, Mark. How are you enjoying retirement? You know, I know we talked a little bit about, you You know, you're happier, you know, you got obviously more free time, less deadlines to deal with. So that has to be good. But how are you enjoying retirement being away from the, the Knicks? Beat? I know you said that, you know, obviously this time of year kind of brings back some nostalgia, some memories because you want to be part of it. But just overall, how do you, how are you enjoying retirement? Yeah, this is literally the only week where I've missed it a little bit, especially yeah. having that one week of hype. Uh, to hype up a a series like it's the Super Bowl. Usually, you know, in the past, before the play-in, you go right to the playoffs, you have like one day or two days to write write preview stories. But this, you had like almost the full week, which is fun. I mean, it's fun. So yeah, this week I've missed it. But overall, it was a tough grind. 23 seasons uh, with the Knicks and their media policy is so brutal, still is brutal. Again, the Julius Randle not being made available uh, and, you know, the reporters obviously aren't happy about that at all. Yeah. Uh, so I've really enjoyed it. Plus, I'm doing stuff. I'm you know writing for the Palm Beach Post, covering uh, yes. tennis a lot. Uh, the Billie Jean King Cup tomorrow and Saturday in Delray Beach. Uh, it's like a Davis Cup for the women's uh, tennis. 
And uh, so I've been doing uh, even scholastic sports out here in Palm Beach County. The weather is amazing, except for this week where it got really rainy and stormy. Yeah. But I mean, we had three months where I didn't see a raindrop. It was freezing in New York and I would go out my door and I'd say, oh, I'm so thankful that I'm here. It was just beautiful <laughs> sunshine, playing a lot of tennis. Yeah. Uh, I live right by the water. Uh, so I've really, I've really loved it. But again, this is the first week where I'm like, wow, I'd, I'd like to be in the mix. But overall, yeah. I'm pretty happy. So it sounds like you're doing exactly what the shirt is telling you to do. <laughs> exactly. Relax. And I love it. I, I, listen, Mark, again, I said it before, I'll say it again. You are a legend in this business. 23 seasons, it's not something that can be overlooked. It was a hard, extremely hard grind. Like you said, the media policy for the Knicks are, it's it's kind of another level in a way, especially when you're forced to write a paper and then the person you're supposed to write the article or paper for isn't there. So you kind of have to go with something else to kind of make it work. And those last minute fly the pants decisions sometimes make it hard. So I 100% agree. I'm happy that you're living your best life over there in Florida. I'm happy that I'm freezing sometimes in New York. And you're very, very warm in Florida. But I got to say, thank you so much for joining the show. We always love having you. If you're not following Mark Berman, please go ahead and do so. His ad is on the screen right now. It only takes a second to follow him. And you can keep up and see what he's doing. Maybe he'll have some more shirts for you. So you never know. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks again, so Mark, much, for joining. Thanks so for the kind words. And uh, yeah, I actually did hear that you guys had a pretty decent winter. It wasn't... Uh, you know, you had some uh, very little snow, actually. So I had to shuffle my car out, so I was happy about that, you know? Yeah, <laughs> that, that was good. But uh, in general, I really appreciate the, the kind words. It was so much fun covering this team. Again, the fans and the podcasts and Nick's Twitter. There's nothing like it in the NBA. I mean, yeah. maybe the Lakers come a little close, but not like the Knicks. It, it's were... really, it was really a blessing to cover a team that has a fan base so passionate. You know, Knicks are probably one of the most passionate fan bases in the uh, on the planet Earth, I yeah. think. I mean, we have fans that cross over borders. I mean, Knicks fans, Brazil, for instance. I mean, we have a whole league over there in terms of people. Yeah. There's a the podcast Knicks. in Australia. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of bizarre how uh, all over the globe uh, there are Knicks fans. And that's why you're known everywhere as well, too, because you cover them in 23 seasons. You've done a great job with it. Like I said before, maybe I'm speaking for myself, or, but I don't think I am. We absolutely miss you on the beat. I think you were one of the best to ever do it. I don't care what anybody says. Um, I thought you asked the right questions. You asked challenging questions. And the reason the players goof around with you is because of that camaraderie you built with them over the course of 23 seasons. You can't fake that or make that up. So I just want to say again, thank you for everything you've done for this business. You're an inspiration to me. And I know a lot of other people who are content creators who are trying to do this. So again, Mark, thank you so much. Thanks so much. It's so nice to hear. And uh, But those guys are grinding. Uh, the beat writers are doing it now. They, they have a tough job. And I think they're doing a really good job too. But Troy, thanks so much for having me. I'm, I'm very honored that you uh, uh, made the invite. Absolutely. You're always invited no matter what, whenever you want. You can always come back on. We'd love to have you. But until next time, Nick fans, don't forget to follow me and Mark and like and subscribe to this. Until next time, Nick fans, we're out of here. Peace. Listen to new episodes of The Knicks Recap, streaming every Friday.